Welcome to Mayfield's Code Corner. My name is Justine Sanchez. I'm the Solar Plus Storage Program Director for Mayfield Renewables. And today I'm covering the Energy Storage Fire Codes Timeline. Um, I think this is an interesting topic because when I first got into looking at the fire codes for energy storage, I was thinking that all these codes are brand new and that's why we're talking about them. But as I dug a little deeper into the history of the fire codes, um, which is actually provided as an annex in the NFPA 855 document, Annex F. They actually walk you through how these energy storage codes um, began, <clears throat> when they began, kind of why they began, and how they've evolved since. And I think it's kind of a cool topic. Um, and the first thing I realized is that energy storage, uh, stationary storage, has been covered by the um, Uniform Fire Code since 1997. Okay, so that's almost 25 years of actual codes um, that have been implemented, although it was really only for commercial applications and only for vented lead acid batteries, VLA batteries, which are the flooded lead acid batteries since 1997. And back then it was 100 gallons of electrolyte and up is what you had to have to be regulated. And there was topics uh, or the, the items that were covered were things like safety venting, okay? Um, we're talking lead acid, flooded lead acid batteries. We wanna ventilate that gas that is released when they're charging and so on. Um, room design and construction was covered. So rooms that contained stationary storage systems had regulations around them, like firewall resistive, uh, fire resistive ratings within the walls. And, and those um, rules uh, were covered actually in the International Building Code. How do you build a wall structure to contain fire? Um, so the specific specifications are, uh, detailed in the IBC in a certain table and section um, back as far as 1997. And there was also real rules about uh, spill control and neutralization. Remember flooded lead acid batteries, what they're regulating here. Ventilation again, um, signs. We wanna warn folks that there's energy storage within this uh, room. And so you have to have signs and um, seismic protection for areas that are you know prone to earthquakes and smoke detection. So that's it. for 25 years now, we've had these rules in play for a specific chemistry and um, amount of electrolyte that we were dealing with. Moving forward, every three years, there's a new code that's released and with it, different things are covered. So when we moved up to 2000, um, actually what was the Uniform Fire Code is now the, uh, the International Fire Code and um, the International Building Code. And so those regulations that started in the UFC are now uh, taken over by the IFC and the IBC. And um, the big change that happened here when it came to the actual rules was that they reduced the amount of electrolyte that you had to have to be regulated. It's now it's down to 50 gallons and up. Um, just to let you know, what does that mean 50 gallons of electrolyte? Well, cause I don't really measure my batteries in terms of gallons, uh, I think in terms of kilowatt hours. So when you're talking about a lead acid battery, that's about 70 kilowatt hours of lead acid batteries that were that you had to have before you were getting regulated. Moving forward into 2003, what were the changes here? Um, well, now the expanded coverage, not just flooded lead acid batteries, but also to sealed batteries. Um, and for the first time, the NFPA-1, which is a different fire code, um, which pertains to areas uh, that don't go by the, by the IFC, but they go by the NFPA-1. Well, now they started covering um, energy storage systems as well. And that was back in 2003. But their coverage uh, or their rules only pertain to vented lead acid batteries at that point. Moving forward to 2006, this is where they started adding different types of chemistries. And um, this is when we started talking about NICADs and for the first time, lithium ion batteries. Um, and so in this case, to be regulated, you had to have a thousand pounds of lithium ion batteries. Once again, I don't deal in pounds for my battery systems. I deal in kilowatt hours. So that, and they really meant, so what that meant was um, basically between 50 kilowatt hours to hundred kilowatt hours of energy storage, lithium ion energy storage um, is what you had to have to be regulated. Why is there a range? Well, those of you that know about lithium ion battery chemistry know that certain chemistries are more energy dense than others. So like nickel magnesium um, cobalt is a high energy dense, dense battery. So you need less of it, you know, less pounds of it to create a certain kilowatt hours. Whereas LFP is less energy dense. So uh, lithium iron phosphate batteries 
And so you actually need more weight, more pounds of that chemistry to create the same amount of kilowatt hours. So back then they went by pounds and the pounds to be regulated equated to essentially 50 to 100 kilowatt hours of lithium ion batteries, depending on the chemistry you used. Moving forward to 2009, um, that's when the NFPA-1 added lithium batteries and NICAD batteries. And for the first time, both the codes, IFC and NFPA-1, IFC and NFPA-1 recognize the need for thermal runaway protection um, for those lithium batteries. Now, moving forward, between 2009, 2012, 2015, not many changes happened, okay? So what's interesting to realize is as you look across the country in different parts of the country, different areas go by different versions of the fire code. And so anywhere between 2009 and 2015, your regulations for energy storage systems are essentially the same. Now, moving into 2018, that's not the case. We had big changes happen in 2018. That's when we started seeing more rules um, for energy storage systems. Rules such as a unit kilowatt hour limitation, like how many kilowatt hours can I have in each unit that I'm installing? And then they wanted to see how far we need, they wanted to regulate how closely we could put those units together. So we have spacing limitations or spacing requirements, I should say, um, for minimum spacing between energy storage units. And then if you deviate from those rules, it triggers a, a large scale fire test. And that's what we know as, you know, the most common version of that is our NFPA, sorry, is our UL 9540A test method, which we're not gonna get into in this particular code, code corner, but know that that's basically what they're talking about here. And so um, the other thing that is really interesting to note is this, it was 2018 was the first time that they introduced residential um, requirements for energy storage systems. So prior to 2018, there were no residential specific requirements for energy storage systems. But now in 2018, there were. They're not many, I and mean, the rules are, are pretty minimal, like do not put these in habitable space, they wanna see them listed um, and so on. But uh, in 2015, there, in prior uh, code cycles, there were no specific residential rules. Now, it's interesting to note that most authorities having jurisdictions are enforcing either the 2015 or the 2018 versions of the IFC and IRC. But we have a new code cycle, 2021, which has been released in a couple of areas or adopted, I should say, by those local jurisdictions. And this is when the, where the energy storage rules get much more strict um, for installation. And we have a new document that was released, NFPA 855, which is the, the standard for installation of stationary storage or energy storage systems, I should say. Um, and the rules that are in that document are, are it's the basis for the 2021 versions of the IFC, the IRC, and NFPA 1. And so they're using, utilizing that document, which is full of energy storage information, um, and they're plucking the rules out of the NFPA 855 document. As a result, there's a lot more of them that, 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 are, that get employed in the 2021 versions of the IFC, the IRC, and NFPA 1. Now, more, more and more states are adopting these codes. Right now, it's really California and New York. Uh, there might be a couple of other jurisdictions I haven't you know, caught up with yet that are they're pulling into 2021 IRC and IFC code territory. Um, but if you're in those areas, you know, it's, this is where you really have to start paying attention because the commercial rules are much more um, intense and the residential rules are um, much deeper now than they used to be as well. So we do cover those rules in detail in other classes that we offer. I go through side by side by side for different jurisdictions, um, whether you're on the 2015, the 2018, or the 2021 versions of the code. So I invite you to come and check us out, check out our courses. Um, you can find us at education at mayfield.energy. That's our email, or just go to our website and you can look up our educational offerings and where we dive more deeply into the fire codes for energy storage systems.